Boyd gets it to Kyer. Kyer with three to Livingston. Long desperation three. It's good! Hey, Ted. Hey, Ted. Hey, Ted. GiantKiller.co and the By George Podcasting Network present an Atlantic 10 original, the Hey, Ted Podcast, featuring Petey Buckets and Grant LeBetz. Tosses it in. Welcome, everybody, to a very special episode of the Hey 10 Podcast. I am PD Buckets. Find me on Twitter, at PD Buckets. I am joined by my buddy Grant Labetz from A10 Talk. Grant, say what's up. PD Buckets, how are we doing today? I am awesome, man. I am uh, very excited for this guest that we have coming on to the pod today. Are you? Very special guest. Uh, I am excited for this big reveal today. Yeah. I think usually when we have people on the podcast as guests, no disrespect to them, but we have to do these big preambles about who they are, what team they root for, you know, are they a fan blogger, do they have their own podcast, uh, stuff like that. I I don't really think we have to do that today, do we? This man needs no introduction, let's just say that. That's right. Uh, I think we can stop being coy uh, and and announce who the special guest is. Uh, Do you want to do the honors? I will do the honors. Uh, We got ESPN bracketologist Joe Lenardi on the podcast today for an interview. Joey Brackets. Joey Brackets. Joey Brackets and Petey Buckets, the uh, the dynamic duo. Um, Hell yeah. We can ride around in a van together solving mysteries. I'm going to ask him about that. Of course, right? Uh, all the uh, this, that's that's why we put him on the podcast. But yeah. um, no, we're super excited for this interview today. Um, we got Joey on talking a lot about A10 hoops, how he sees the uh, NCAA tournament shaping out with the uh, Atlantic Ten, how many bids we're getting, and you're gonna have to stay tuned to see if your bubble team is gonna make it into the big dance. Because let me tell you, this guy is good about predicting NCAA tournament brackets. Hell yeah. And we are uh, we are recording this intro before we're actually talking to him. So usually when you do an interview like this, you sort of do the interview first and then you record the intro um, because you can sort of like allude to some things that you talked about. We're not doing that in the interest of time. I have a family now. I know Grant's got his own shit to do. Um, so we're sort of like using some of this downtime to record the intro. And I'm actually feeling a little bit nervous. Like I'm a, I'm a grown adult. I shouldn't really feel nervous in conversations like this, but it's, uh, it's happening a little bit. It's a bit nerve wracking. I mean, this is definitely the biggest name we've had on the Hey 10 podcast before. You know, you guys have all been loyal with listeners and half the time it's just Petey and I uh, yep. talking crap. And, you know, sometimes we don't know what we talk about, but uh, I am very excited to, to talk th- to Joey Brack and see what th- he has to say. I think the second biggest name we've had on this podcast is Sully. Which Probably. is just, just kind of sad. Hey, Sorry, Black, so, shout out to the Blackburn Review, though. They've been Blackburn doing a good Review's job. killing it, man. I know. Yeah, no, they're doing they're doing great stuff. Um, but yeah, Joey Brackets, little bit, a uh, little bit more cachet. I think, a little bit of a bigger point. name, just a little bit. No yeah. disrespect to you, Sully. We love you, man, and we got to get you back on the podcast here at some point if you're listening. That's right. Give especially, us a shout on Twitter. Especially since Dayton is uh, is just atomizing teams, he'll probably be a pretty fun guest right now. Of course. Um, but yeah, uh, stay tuned, everybody. We will uh, be right back with the Joe Lenardi episode. This is the Hey Ten pro- Podcast, uh, brought to you by KLM Law Firm. Um, Grant, do you have a, you want to plug um, the A10 Talk message boards, right? Yeah, I got to give a shout out to A10Talk.com message boards. Uh, we got the St. Bonaventure community to move over. A lot of the uh, SB Unfurled, if you follow them on Twitter, uh, great account. Um, he hit me up and said, hey, a couple of us looking for a new band. Uh, you know, the bandwagon was where they were before, and they aren't a big fan of that for their message boards, so they moved over to our site. Got a lot of messages popping, so if you're a St. Bonaventure basketball fan, that's the place to be to talk hoops before, during, oh, and yeah. after the game. And if you're an A-10 fan, all the better. We got a lot of conversation going on there. Tons of people signing up. Join the A-10 Talk message boards at A10Talk.com. But enough about you and I. I think yep. uh, we should get into the, the man of the hour, Joey Brackets, and the interview coming up. Stay tuned for Joe Lenardi. This is the Hey 10 Podcast brought to you by KMM Law Firm, GiantKiller.co, and A-10 Talk. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have a special guest on today's podcast. As you know, it's uh, normally the hashtag Hey 10 podcast. 
podcast with Grant Lebeds and PD Buckets, but today we've got the hashtag Hey 10 podcast with Grant Lebeds, PD Buckets, and Joey Brackets. Uh, that's right, we've got ESPN's bracketologist Joe Lenardi with us here today to talk some hoops and break down the league's chances at multiple tourney bids. Joe, thanks for taking the time, and how are you doing today? It's my pleasure, guys. Uh, yesterday was, what, two months until Selection Sunday, yesterday being Wednesday the 15th. And uh, for me, that's always kind of the ceremonial midpoint of the season. In my head, it goes, you know, November 15th, January 15th is halftime, and then March 15th on or about is Selection Sunday. And this year, it falls exactly uh, on March 15th. The Ides of March for the uh, Shakespearean scholars in the room. Yes, sir. I mean, college football is over, so it's coming up quickly. Uh, we got our countdown calendars out, as I'm sure you do. Um, but before we get into some bracketology, which is why we have you on the podcast here today, uh, I saw you talking a bit on Twitter about that Ryan Daly shot the other day, and I assume you were in person uh, to see that shot go in against David Davidson. Where does that rank on your buzzer beaters that you've seen in your lifetime watching hoops? Wow. Well, believe it or not, full disclosure, I was not on site. Uh, I was actually in, uh, in in Northern California, which, you know, is not a typical part of the bracketology routine. Uh, but I was doing a couple of ESPN assignments at St. Mary's. And, and it's kind of something that's been added to my plate this season with the network when I can to try and be more like a committee member and go see you know, the key bubble teams in person, if possible. And they were playing BYU on a Thursday night. It was it was a TV game for St. Joe's back to Philadelphia. So uh, it was deemed uh, by me, I suppose, to be less of an important uh, game to have uh, a color analyst as I, as I try and do more national things. But I was watching at 1030 in the morning on the West Coast uh, when it came on. And my, my feeling then as now, and having spoken to Ryan last night when St. Joe's played Rhode Island in Philly, was I think he was the only person in the building who knew it was a three when it went up because he did a toe tap like a wide receiver uh, to, to, to get, well, shot is generous, more like a deflection or a redirection, right? Isn't that how you would describe it? And um, I, I I thought exactly the same thing when I was watching it live. I was like, oh, that that's a two. Cool of course. shot. But in fact, cool if shot, you look at over. Yeah. if you look at Billy Lang, he shook hands. Coach, yeah. He goes down to shake hands. Yep. And everybody on the bench kind of goes, well, that was really great, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, cool and, shot. But game's over. Who cares? And, and Ryan Daly, who you know would want to beat you if he was playing you in Monopoly, would you know, begged to differ. And, and he knew exactly what he was doing with his right foot. Now, what I haven't asked him or had a chance to ask any of our league officials or whomever I run into is, you know, when he did the toe tap as he was touching the ball, was that a travel, right? Uh, but it's moot now, Dayton won in overtime, but uh, it, it was amazing. Probably in terms of buzzer beaters that I've witnessed in person, Having been, you know, courtside for Christian Leitner, that's going to be pretty tough to beat. Uh, but I, I, I did see a, a, a year after Leitner, the Hawks go the length of the court in even less time, 2.3 at the old field house to beat GW. Carlin Worley threw a pass to Bernard Blunt, who made one right in front of press row for a win. And you guys are going to tell me you weren't even alive then, and which is going to maybe kind of end <laughs> the podcast. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, th those, those come to mind. Yeah, that's great. And I think we'll just sort of smile and nod at those for the most part. We recognize Leitner, not sure about the other ones, uh, <laughs> but Grant, we want to get into some bracketology. Yeah, definitely a cool shot. I wasn't there, so I had to get your, uh, your thoughts on it, but definitely one I wish I would have been able to see in person. Uh, let's talk some bracketology. Obviously you are Joey Brackets, Mr. Brackets. Um, and I know you follow the A-10, you've seen a lot of A-10 games. As a whole, you know the conference has been a lot better. We've got six teams in the net top 100 right now. Um, but other than Dayton, no one has really solidified themselves as a surefire tourney team, and you know that, obviously. Uh, but in your latest bracket, you did have Dayton, you had VCU, and you had Duquesne as the automatic qualifier. Obviously, they're a little bit further off the bubble right now. Um, but let's start with Duquesne. Um, Let's talk briefly. Do you think they have a shot at an at-large this year? Or are those two quadrant three losses that they picked up at the end of uh, non-conference play going to weigh too heavily against them? Uh, the short answer is they don't have a realistic shot at an at-large. 
unless they were to, you know, really make hay in all their up games in the league, you know, against the other NCAA level contenders that are in the Atlantic 10. Um, and, and I did see Duquesne uh, in person a week ago for the first time. Uh, they, they were better than I thought. Uh, their length defensively is more impressive in person than it is, uh, you know, on television. And they have a lot of ways to score. And I think Keith Keith Dambrot is a terrific coach. Uh, you know, they're 5-0 and in the Atlantic 10 and 15-2 and overall. Whatever tournament they go to, even if it's, just the Atlantic 10 tournament. This is the best Duquesne performance I know of your lifetimes and maybe maybe pushing mine. I know they were really good with Norm Nixon in the 70s. I was not a bracketologist then. I was in grade school. But um, this, this is a remarkable job that he has done. Uh, having said that, if you plugged anybody at Duquesne into a lie detector and said, did you think you'd be 15 and two and five and zero, oh, they would look at your cross side uh, because if they had known that, that they would be this good, they wouldn't have again scheduled so softly in the non-conference. It's not the couple losses that are going to keep them out. It's the absence of wins in the non-conference wins that matter. Right. I mean, if you play, you know, mm -hmm eight or nine or ten quad one quad two games in the non-conference and lose two quad three games you can survive that right because you have better wins than you have losses but that's not going to be the case for them unless they're overwhelmingly successful in their up games in the league and i mean heck last night wednesday night they almost lost a down game at home to fordham prevailing in overtime in pittsburgh and let, let's not forget they don't even have a home court this year you know, they're playing in the environs of Pittsburgh on a game-to-game -game basis. They might be in the old Civic Arena parking lot, for all I know. Yeah, and that's, uh, I think, the Fordham loss definitely would have driven a nail in the state, nail in the coffin, so to speak, um, of the at-large hopes. But, you know, we're an A-10 podcast. It's a topic of conversation. I think me and Grant sort of landed at the same place. It was like, yeah, better And it's team cool to type expect. Duquesne. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, yeah, exactly. to their credit, and, I've you know, I, I have a strange but true following on social media, I suppose. And people are, oh, how can you put Duquesne in? Well, you know, as anybody who follows regularly knows, if you're leading the league, you get in. That's how it works. And I people say, well, if they're tied with Dayton, you should make Dayton the AQ, which I would if they were tied with Dayton. But when they're the outright, that better mimics selection weekend because the favorites don't all win. And to give the most accurate picture of the at large you know kind of cut line and bubble you can't simply put all the favorites in i just do it as the cards fall and and this year this moment this tomorrow friday when a new bracket goes up uh duquesne will be in because they're five and oh and nobody else is i didn't make the schedule i'm only reading yeah. the results no 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 and th and that makes total sense and i think we got to um uh, we've got a few other teams we want to ask you about. So we've got a few that are like sort of in the middle um, mm -hmm. in the A-10 here. Uh, speaking sort of on the other side of the coin, uh, Rhode Island actually put together a really tough out of conference schedule. Um, they failed to pick up any marquee wins. I think they lost to LSU, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, so they look pretty decent in the net rankings. Um, but I'm curious, they, they do have a bad loss against Brown, but they just won on the road against VCU. Um, do you see them as relatively close to the bubble, or are they the sort of team that's just really got to have a great conference season uh, in order to work their way back into the conversation? More the latter, I would say very good conference season. Uh, you know, they don't have to win the regular season necessarily because the league, again, has enough quality in it that you're getting more opportunities. Last year was kind of the exception, maybe the last year or two, right? It, 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 it seems to have hit bottom and is rebounding some. And just in a micro sense, I'll throw in that their win over Alabama is looking a little better today after Alabama ended ended uh, Auburn's unbeaten uh, hopes on Wednesday night. So you, you, you say there's a middle group of teams in the A-10, including Rhode Island. Let me tell you how tight they are. I, I typically evaluate 85 to 90 teams on a daily basis for the 68, okay? 
And that includes all the one bids, the league winners that typically fall like in the 50 to 68 range, right? And then we start counting again from 69 to, you know, maybe 90, 95 at the start of the season. And then that number starts to shrink. So right now it's in the 85 range. Well, teams 83, 84, and 85 are all Atlantic 10 schools. St. Louis, Richmond, and your question, Rhode Island. They're almost impossible to separate, but at this moment, St. Louis has beaten Richmond at Richmond. So they, I give them a, you know, a sliver of an edge. Richmond has beaten Rhode Island at Rhode Island. So I give them a sliver of an edge. And I suppose if Rhode Island was going head to head with Dayton, which they're not at this point, uh, in terms of bracket positioning, they would have to get, you know, they've got the best win of the group, but maybe the slightly weakest overall profile. But again, by, you know, as thin as a, as a, as a slice of ham, a thin slice of ham, not like a Easter slice of ham, like a sandwich ham. <laughs> and another team uh, that I know you've had in the bracket, but is probably falling off a little bit and definitely not at that same middle group, but probably starting to slip down into that range might be VCU. Um, you know, after that home loss to Day- or sorry, road loss to Dayton, and home loss to Rhode Island, probably falling off the bubble a little bit. I know you publish a new bracketology tomorrow, I believe, so we might not see the the Rams in that um, in that publication tomorrow. But uh, what do you think VCU has to do? Is there a chance they can get in without a win over Dayton? Because that's kind of their big remaining opportunity. Yeah, and I think I misspoke saying Rhodey had beaten Dayton. They had, of course, won last weekend at VCU. At this moment, VCU is seventy-one. Uh, and, and that's, you know, obviously a dangerous spot. It's a great spot if you're on the way up. Uh, it's not so good if, if, if you're on the way down. And look, I'm not an eye test guy. Uh, and I'm never going to be because fundamentally that's not what my process is about. But like they're clearly good enough. Okay. And it, it's, it's, it's more of a comment on, I think in their case, bad luck. They lost the two one-possession games to Purdue and Tennessee. They get either of them, and we're not having the conversation. They get both, and, you know, we're, we're talking about them more as Dayton's wingman than being on, on the bubble. And I still think there's, there's every chance that they can get there for two reasons. Y- you know, they, they could beat Dayton at home. Uh, they have other opportunities in the league. And the teams that are just in the tournament at this point in time, history tells me that more of them are going to go down the sliding board than up uh, because they're fundamentally average to begin with or they wouldn't be on the bubble, right? Like Minnesota's in at 10 and 7 and 4 and 3 in the Big Ten. They're going to struggle to stay above 500 in the Big Ten. I think Oklahoma... Uh, 500 in the Big 12, you know, couple nice wins, a lot of losses. They're going to have a lot of power losses at the end of the year. Maybe I shouldn't use that as an, as an example. You know, they got in four games under last year in their league, two games under the year before that. That's six games under aggregate in two years with two at-large bids. It's moments like that, you know, when I want to quit and become an accountant. <laughs> You heard it here first on the Hate 10 podcast. <laughs> That's exactly right. And let me tell you, if people think I'm a bad bracketologist, I'd be a crappy accountant. <laughs> and uh, the the bubble's messy, I think, certainly at the at the tail end for you know who who's going to get those last few spots. But I also think it's messy on the top seed lines. And one of the questions I wanted to make sure we asked was about Dayton and where you see them realistically ending up. Because I see people talk about them on the two seed line, maybe the three seed line. Um, and where I start to have questions is this is a team where their best wins are going to be against, you know, St. Mary's, Georgia, Virginia Tech, uh, probably that VCU win. Um, so can a team without any really like top level wins, like realistically, what do they have to do to work their way into two or three? Because personally, I see them more in maybe the three or four kind of range. I don't think they're going to get to two. Okay. Uh, sh- short of, you know, running the like table. Like an undefe- undefeated kind of conference thing. season, yeah. Uh, right now on my board, heading into bracket tomorrow, Friday, uh, they're 10th, which puts them in the middle of the three seeds. Uh, they've got there more because of the Louisvilles and the Marylands losing than the Daytons winning. And and they've gotten there because they're really good. 
okay? And and we, we should be mindful of that. If we want to kind of follow your lead and set the over and under at three and a half as their seed wager, I would also bet the under be, because, you know, I, I think they could lose road games in the league because the league is better. I mean, heck, I, I, I saw them in a, in a four-minute game at St. Joe's, and St. Joe's is last in the league. So what will be unfair is if they're uh, disproportionately penalized for a road loss when, as I said before, you know, it, it almost doesn't matter what the Oklahomas of the world do. Right. Like, yeah. like they, they can just lose almost indiscriminately. Yeah, that totally uh, makes sense. And, I, and, I and think... be bulletproof. And, and, you know, in another life when, you know, there's no committee, there's just, you know, the czar of one, you know, I'll make sure and correct that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Grant, do you want to wrap it up? Yeah. Um, so fi- I think final question we have for you, and I've been, it's been awesome to get a little insight into what tomorrow's bracket looks like and I think what goes on a little bit further off the bubble that we might not see in your tweets. Um, but if you have to be uh, predictive here for us on the Hey 10 podcast and give us kind of an over under on how many eight, 10 teams are going to make the tournament, uh, could you give us that number? Also, of that group, that middle of the pack you mentioned, St. Louis, Richmond, and Rhode Island, uh, give us one that you think has the best chance of making the NCAA tournament. At the- well, until this morning, I thought it was Richmond. And then hearing about Blake Francis being out for, you know, the, the better part of the remainder of the regular season. I mean, that is a significant hit, uh, not just their leading score. I'm not sure he's their best player. I think that's probably Gilliard. Uh, and, and, you know, their most unique player is probably Golden. Uh, but it's still 17, 18 points a game. And, you know, I think the campus of the university is rich and beautiful, but I, but I don't think Chris Mooney is going to be able to walk outside tomorrow and find somebody walking around who can do that. Uh, so, so, you know, until we see how they are now without them, although they, you know, they took care of Davidson pretty good on the road without him. That might be more a comment about Davidson yep. than it is gl- about I'm Richmond. Gl- I'm glad people outside the A-10 are starting to realize that. No question. I mean, you know, sometimes the whole doesn't equal the parts in in basketball, and sometimes it exceeds them. And and Dayton hasn't been right from the beginning, and now they've lost. Or Davidson. Davidson hasn't been right from the beginning, and, you know, now the wheels are are falling off the wagon a little bit. In fairness, I haven't seen St. Louis. Uh, I did see Rhode Island last night playing without Jeff Doughton, who had a kind of a seemed to me to be an arbitrary one game suspension, you know, for, for walking the wrong little old lady across the street to a charity <laughs> game or, you know, I don't know. I don't know uh, what, what the issue is. I'm, I'm sure they have their reasons at the NCAA. I think Rhode Island has the most pieces outside of VCU and of course Dayton. Uh, if, if I had a better mortgage payment today, I'd say that the league would again get two. The last two years, they were somewhat fortunate to get two with the way the conference tournament broke. I think this year, it'll probably be unfortunate because they have more than two NCAA level teams. I just don't know that it's going to fall their way. Uh, It always happens in the A-10 tournament. It seems uh, somebody not ranked one or two ends up winning the whole thing and, you know, we're all celebrating as fans of the conference because all of a sudden we got two or three teams in when it looked like one or two instead. So uh, we'll see if it ends up going that way. But, you know, we're definitely rooting on at least two, maybe three, you know, who knows, maybe four bids in the uh, NCAA but, tournament. But, but you know, the trend is up. And if, 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 if you're Ken Palm readers, which I'm sure you are, you know, his top five in the league, none of them are seniors. Now, one of them is leaving, presumably, and it's not the top in who plays for Rhode Island. But, but, but uh, he, like Dayton would be a tournament team without him. They're really then, good, yeah. right? Right. So I, I think uh, good times are ahead for our league. League is trending up. I like to hear that. <laughs> well, Joe, we only had one way to go. Only one way to go up after last year. Well, Joe, That's thank right. you, right. thank you so much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Uh, we know you're a busy man, and it's only going to get busier for you between now and selection sunday as you mentioned we got the countdown calendars going and we're excited 
Um, we always appreciate your coverage and love for the 810. It's awesome to have a, the ESPN bracketologist on our side of things, uh, and we think you do an incredible job. Been a pleasure to talk with you and looking forward to seeing your bracket uh, tomorrow and the rest before Selection Sunday. Um, and thanks again, really, for taking the time and uh, coming on the podcast today. Thanks, guys. I follow you as well. Enjoy the year. Of course. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Take it easy. Welcome back to the Hey 10 Podcast, everybody, sponsored by KMN Law Firm. Uh, we've also got some A10 Talk message boards to plug. Uh, this is PD Buckets here with Grant LeBetz. Uh, we just got done interviewing Joe Lenardi, and we could not be any more excited to uh, sit down and just uh, you know talk a little bit about what we learned from him. Yeah, really great guy. Joe, uh, Joe is awesome and incredibly personable, and that was a fun 20 minutes talking to him. So I'm incredibly excited we got that interview. and. Um, just so so nice of him, right? To I know. Uh, you know, just to to take our request, like, hey, will you come on our podcast? <laughs> and I, and you know, he was yeah. pulling like conference stats out of his head all day. I think it's just he does this all day, coming on you know radio shows, doing interviews for podcasts, and I'm sure he's looking at these teams day in day out, and just kind of has this like data bank in his head of where every team stands, and he could, you know could pull right out like, oh yeah, Richmond, they're at you know eighty four or whatever yeah. it was. We didn't get a chance to ask him, but I'm guessing he hibernates from like April through June or something, because um, the dude is just so busy. Like he, like we, we, I've seen him on TV a couple times recently. Um, he does radio spots. He says yes to a little podcast like ours. He's a he's a color commentator for a lot of these games. Um, so yeah, just su- super super awesome to have him on. Um, Grant, what did you what did you learn? What was your big takeaway? Uh, big takeaway, I liked to get. Uh, a good sense of where the, let's call it like the Joe Lenardi beyond the bracket stood. Um, I think sometimes I'll look for his tweets and see uh, the kind of the considered list he always throws out there. And, you know, maybe you don't see, maybe you see five or six teams listed there. You don't see Richmond, you don't see St. Louis. Uh, but he kind of shared with us that they're in the 80s range right now if the bracket ends at 68. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we know that this middle of the pack team tier of St. Louis, of Richmond, of Rhode Island, um, you know, they all have a chance, but it's really going to take one kind of emerging and having a better conference season than the rest. And I mean, we're only a couple games into Atlantic 10 conference play, but as Joe mentioned, you know, you already have St. Louis beating Richmond on the road, Richmond beating Rhode Island on the road, and, uh, you know, Rhode Island, I'm getting all jumbled up now who did rhode island lose rhode island has not played st louis yet no they haven't played so, st louis so but if rhode island beats st louis then that completes the circuit yeah the, exactly squad, exactly right? yeah um but i i think it was interesting to see that middle of the pack and it just it does confirm that the league is up completely because you might only have last year one or two teams that are even close to that range other than vcu um you know and it's definitely like joe said at the end of the podcast um it's reassuring that you know now we have the league on on its way up, and you know hopefully last year was kind of the the bottom of the barrel. Yep, yep, uh, yeah, and I think that's um, I think that's right. I thought it was really interesting that he said that they were all. Um, he's got them like right next to each other, right? What do you say, eighty three, eighty four, eighty five, um, something like that? Like they're all just like super tightly packed together, um, which I think makes sense. But it's nice to hear it that like you know uh, evaluated or you know. Um, the hell am I trying to say? Legitimized, confirmed, or whatever by 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 a guy who knows <laughs> who knows what he's talking about, um, and isn't a isn't a fanalist like we are, right? So, and I know he didn't give us a definitive answer, so I do want to pick your brain a bit. But um, when asked if he had to pick one of those three teams to emerge from the pack, not saying it's necessarily going to happen, um, he said it would have been Richmond if it weren't for the Blake Francis injury. Uh, Blake yep. Francis, I think, out four to six weeks with an injury, so he might be back in time for eight ten tournament play. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. yeah, and I think that makes sense because Richmond has the best win right now, right? Um, they've already beaten Rhode Island, um, and they also beat Wisconsin. And Wisconsin, like w- Wisconsin, is one of those teams that looked awful in the beginning of the year. But if you look, Wisconsin's actually on a streak. They were five and five at one point. They're eleven and six now. Um, they got wins over Penn State, Maryland, Ohio State. 
So when Richmond beat them, they looked like absolute trash. And I remember tweeting through the game, but that's a win that just like is, is just aging so well for them. Um, St. Louis's best win, I think, is against uh, Kansas State, maybe. Um, or actually, it's, St. Louis's best win is probably against Richmond right now. Um, Kansas State, I think we all thought that was going to be a better win when it happened, but Kansas State is really, uh, really falling off the wagon. Um, and then Rhode Island uh, got that Alabama win, um, and that's picking up steam. Um, so, you know, I think it, it makes sense to me that he picked Richmond simply because they've got that marquee win against, uh, uh, against Wisconsin, excuse me, to hang their hat on. Mm-hmm. And I, I wanted to mention this too, didn't get a chance uh, during the interview, but I think there is a chance that the Richmond loss to Radford, obviously that's their worst loss right now. It's a quadrant three loss um, on a neutral court. I think there's a chance that becomes a quadrant two loss by the end of the year. Uh, mm-hmm. The neutral cutoff is, is top 100. I don't know if uh, Radford's going to end up being a top 100 team. They're 137th right now. But yeah. I think according to Ken Palm, they're the best team in the Big South, which means you know if they win, let's say, 15, 16 games in that conference, and some of them are pretty decisive, you might start to see them sneak up a bit, and all of a sudden a quadrant two loss doesn't look as bad as a quadrant three loss. So exactly. that's something to keep an eye out with, uh, with Richmond. But Yeah. So one other thing you mentioned, um, and this is sort of moving on from the middle of the pack. I think we, I think we set our piece there and I think everybody knows like, you know, if any of those teams gets a win against Dayton, then obviously we've got to take them a lot more seriously for an at large. Um, but VCU, uh, is an interesting case cause he's got him on the outside looking in right now. He's got him around 70. I think he said 71, uh, which is not, not where you want to be in a bracket of 68. Mm-hmm. Yeah. VCU definitely on the outside looking in. And I think an interesting point he made, um, uh, was how different, of a story we're telling if um, VCU wins those two games down in Florida. You know, they lost to Purdue by three points. Uh, they lost to Tennessee by three points on a buzzer beater on an out-of-bounds out play. Um, definitely unfortunate losses. But, you know, Joe says we're not even having this conversation at this point. And, you know, Purdue's yep. a team that starts to get better. Uh, they're one of the more interesting teams in the and, nation. They've got a lot of losses and um, yeah. still picked up some big wins. But, um, yep. Like, like any other team in the conference, I, I think Joe, set, Joe hit the nail on the head with there's a lot of good opportunities, especially on the road this year. Yeah. Right now they're one in three, quadrant one, uh, but they'll have an opportunity at Rhode Island, at Richmond, at St. Louis, and at home against Dayton. So, you know, certainly yeah. not out of the con- conversation yet. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's a good illustration of like you know we're we're analytics guys. We look at Ken Palm a lot, but that's a good illustration of like how cruel and binary the bracket process can be, right? Is like Ken Palm, Ken Palm. If you play Tennessee and you play Purdue really close at a neutral site, Ken Palm gives you a lot of credit for that, right? Um, the bracket does not. The bracket is unforgiving and it only looks at wins and losses. I guess net takes into account margin of victory to an extent. Um, but it's like, you know, they didn't, they didn't win either of those two games, which is just really, I think going to be killer, um, in there, you know, when selection Sunday comes around, either it's going to exclude them from the tournament entirely, or it's going to put them on a pretty bad seed line that maybe they wouldn't prefer. Exactly. Um, and you know, looking at VCU's best wins right now, obviously the start to conference play, uh, not a lot of great opportunities with Fordham and George Mason now slipping, you know, that might've been a quadrant two road win at one point. Now it's quadrant three. Um, you know, their best win holding up still is LSU at home, and I think the Tigers are off to a 4 0 start to SEC play, so that win's certainly looking better. But, you know, you look at their second best win at this point, and it's a quadrant two road win over Charleston, one that, um, you know, VCU trailed by double digits in the second half. Yeah. So, like yeah, I said, t- I think they're. Uh, they're tough com- to hang your hat on that for an average right, case. Right, right. Yeah. But, uh, yep. you know, like their conference schedule gets a lot tougher towards the end. So I think that's where they're going to make their money. They cannot afford, uh, they get their Philly road trip that Dayton had at the beginning of the year uh, coming up here at uh, January 21st, January 25th against St. Joe's and LaSalle cannot afford to lose either of those games. For sure. Uh, let's move on to the Dukes. Uh, we did ask him about two Kane. I don't know if we need to spend a, t- a ton of time here. Cause I think you just confirmed our suspicion. Um, he very diplomatically told us that the Dukes really have no chance at an at-large bid, uh, which I think makes sense because like it doesn't the the gaudy record doesn't matter when you play an out-of-conference schedule. That's just that week, right? Um, and he said, short of like fully running the table or something in uh, in A10 play, um, they're just like they're really not even going to be in the conversation. Yeah, and I I think what was interesting, I thought maybe in my head that bad losses weighed a little bit more than good wins, but it, it seemed like Joe kind of thought the opposite or at least thought that you can 
play your way out of bad losses with more good wins. Um, yeah. And unfortunately for Duquesne, yeah, Davidson slipping up a little bit. Normally a home win over Davidson is a really good win in conference play. That's their first program win ever over the Wildcats. Still doesn't mean a lot. Um, Duke's holding their, their hat on the best wins uh, against Indiana State and St. Louis. Again, a team that like Joe said, is really going to have to beat Dayton and beat a lot of these other middle-of-the-pack teams to have any sort of a shot. But uh, the overtime win by two last night over Fordham makes me suspicious that uh, they'll even be competitive with some of those teams. Yeah, yeah. and I think that's uh, we can sort of we can put the Duquesne at large talk to bed for now. So you, even if they do get a marquee win like at VC or at Dayton, I think it's pretty clear that they they need to have like a really incredibly gaudy record in conference to uh, to to even be in the conversation. Um, and then finally, I thought the last interesting thing was like I was really curious about Dayton's seed line because I think Dayton's definitely going to be in the top ten um, this week. Because forgive me, but I know a few of the teams ahead of them in the top ten lost. Um, yep, Kentucky's ahead of them. They lost. I think Florida State lost. I think, um, oh, did they? Louisville or some or somebody, somebody, it's like three teams that are in front of them lost, I think. So they're going to be maybe, maybe around 10, probably top 10. I see people on Twitter talking them to them, talking about them as a potential two seed. Um, I don't really see it. Neither did Joe. Joe pretty clearly said uh, that they're going to be a three seed. He didn't say it in that many words, but he said they're definitely not a two seed. Um, and then he said if they, if you set the over under at three and a half for their seed, he would take the under. So it's like the only option remaining <laughs> is that like they're not a one seed. Um, so, you know, they're, they're going to be a three seed. So I thought that was interesting. And obviously that's assuming that they go like 17 and one in conference or something. Um, I think but that, yeah. I think that comes no, back sorry, to ahead. the idea of getting good wins, which unfortunately, yep. I mean, in the A-10, Dayton is the good win, so there really isn't that many opportunities. Uh, with the exception, there's a couple quadrant one road wins. You've got at VC, you've got at Rhode Island, at Richmond, at Duquesne, but again, if some of these teams, oh, and at St. Louis. So I guess the, the Flyers do have five remaining quadrant one wins, but still, you might look at a team like Kansas or a team like Duke and you know some of these teams in the Big 12 or the ACC that are not going to run the table, but are going to get like 10 or 15 quadrant one wins throughout conference play if they keep playing yeah. well. I mean, y you look at that and Dayton just can't compete in terms of number of good wins. They're just going to, yeah. yeah, that's exactly right. All these teams um, are just going to keep piling up. Like if you look at, you know, Butler, Auburn, Duke, Baylor, um, you know, even uh, maybe not San Diego State quite as much, but like everybody like around the top 20 conversation, even some of those teams behind Dayton, like Villanova, Michigan State, Wichita State, Maryland. Um, oh, I guess Maryland lost too. But like all those teams are like, they have so many opportunities in conference to go on the road and pick up these really awesome wins that are going to look great on their resume. And Dayton just doesn't have that. So I, I think if they have a really good conference season, they're probably locked into a three seed. So Joe said it just intuitively, I think it, it makes a lot of sense based on their season. Yeah. And I mean, like you mentioned, this is the difference between the eight people and like, uh, and Ken Palm essentially. And the, tournament selection committee process, right? I mean, it, like the difference between a win and a loss, especially in overtime to Ken Palm or to the AP poll, if you're playing well, uh, really isn't that much. But when it comes to making the NCAA tournament, you know, you lose to Colorado, you lose to Kansas. Those are two quadrant run games you could have picked up that, you know, move your record to 4-0 and in quadrant one instead of 2-2. Two and two. Uh, But, you know, I think we look at those games and say, heck, that's a great loss for Dayton. They played really well. You know, they fought down to the wire. They didn't <laughs> yeah. have a couple, you know, bad turnovers in the last few minutes. They get, a, you know, a win over a top three team in the country. Uh, but, you know, the selection committee, especially when you have an elite team like the Dayton Flyers, unfortunately doesn't really look at the final score or what happened during the game. It literally is just black and white, win or lose. This is how it plays in. Yeah, and the purpose of us recording this segment is just to sort of twist the knife and make Dayton fans feel even a little bit worse about not pulling off that win <laughs> in Maui against Kansas, which yeah. definitely would have had you in the conversation for maybe a, a two-seed line, which I think would have been just ideal. Heck, I mean, and um, Colorado, too. I mean, Dayton led that game by 10, 15 the first couple minutes, and... Uh, oh man, we could yeah. we could play this hindsight any, game all, any all other, we want. Any but... other mean things we want to say? Oh about man, no, right you know we love Dayton. No, nah, we do. They're 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 so they're having an awesome season. Uh, they're gonna beat my Mason Patriots by like seven hundred points. Yeah. Um, and I'm gonna do my best not to uh not to lose lose my stuff when it happens. <laughs> I mean, is there any is there any stuff to lose at this point? That's my question. 
Uh, you know, you'd be surprised. Um, okay. Generally, I uh, held it together pretty well, I think, yesterday with the GW loss. Um, and, you know, a lot of that was due to a fussy baby. So sure. I was like, you know, uh, thankfully, uh, actually missed a lot of the second half mm-hmm. um, when things were just sort of unraveling. Um, but yeah, it's just like that's a that's a that's a subject for a different yeah. podcast. Is like the state the state of Mason Nation right now? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm in the same boat with Davidson. I think uh, it's it's been a a bad season for Hay Ten rooting interests, but a good season for the conference as a whole. I think we could yep. we could sum it up like that. <laughs> yep, exactly. So um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here, right? Yeah, I think this is the shortest podcast we've ever done. Um, I'm PD Buckets. Follow me on Twitter at PD Buckets. This is the Hey 10 podcast sponsored by KMN Law Firm. Uh, Grant uh, Lebetz from A10 Talk at A10 Talk on Twitter. Um, and uh, check out the A10 Talk message boards. Uh, that's something that you guys are, uh, are are getting fired up over there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, check them out and uh, be sure to check out PD Buckets uh, and giant, GiantKiller.co. Uh, you guys do a great job right. over there. Um, even though I know Mason's struggling a bit. But yep. again, thank you guys, as always, for listening. This has been the Hey 10 Podcast with Joe Lenardi, Joey Brackets today. That was a ton of fun, and I am still forever thankful. If you are listening to this, <laughs> Joe Lenardi, thank you so much for coming on. There's no chance he's listening. Thank you, all, <laughs> thank you all the same, Joey Brackets. Oh, man. Yeah. Oh, this is a, yeah. Thank you guys a ton. <laughs> this has been fun. Uh, well, signing off for now, we'll be uh, back soon with a new podcast. and. Plenty of juicy conference musings to talk about as we move forward. So uh, thanks, guys, again. Have you ever drafted a will for yourself? Should you create a trust? What about obtaining financial or medical powers of attorney? If you're not sure what to do, give the lawyers of Condori, Murad, and Neeson a call. With locations in both Fairfax and Arlington, the KMN Law Firm is the place to go for all your real estate-related needs. Regardless of where you live, they'll be able to guide you through the process in a convenient and comforting manner. Give them a call at 703-385-2080 or visit them online at www.kmnlawfirm.com and be sure to tell them the Giant Killer team sent you. Again, that's www.kmnlawfirm.com.